Chapter Thirteen of the Man Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandra Chatrion. Chapter Thirteen. Sperver had gone, bearing the body of poor Leverlé in his cloak. I had declined to follow. My sense of duty kept me by this unhappy woman, and I could not leave her without violence to my own feelings. Besides, I must confess I was curious to see a little more closely this strange, mysterious being, and therefore, as soon as Sperver had disappeared in the darkness of the glen, I began to climb up to reach the cavern. There I beheld a strange sight. Extended upon a large cloak of white fur lay the aged woman in a long and ragged robe of purple, her fingers clutching her breast, a golden arrow through her gray hair. Never shall I forget the figure of this strange woman, her vulture-like features distorted with the last agonies of death, her eyes set, her gasping mouth were fearful to look upon. Such might have been the terrible Queen Fridegonda. The baron, on his knees at her side, trying to restore her to animation, but I saw at a glance that the wretched creature was dying, and it was not without a profound sense of pity that I took her by the arm. "'Leave Madame alone. Don't touch her,' cried the young man with irritation. "'I am a surgeon, Monseigneur.' He looked in silence at me for a moment, then rising, said, "'Pardon me, sir.' pray forgive my hasty language he trembled with excitement scarcely yet subdued and presently he went on what is your opinion sir it is over she is dead then without speaking another word he sat upon a large stone with his forehead resting upon his hand and his elbow on his knee his eyes motionless as still as a statue I sat near the fire, watching the flames rising to the vaulted roof of the cave, and casting lurid reflections upon the rigid features of the corpse. We had sat there an hour, as motionless as statues, each deep in thought, when, suddenly lifting his head, the baron said, "'Sir, all this utterly confounds me. Here is my mother. For twenty-six years I thought I knew her and now an abyss of horrible mysteries opens before me. You are a doctor. Tell me, did you ever know anything so dreadful? Monseigneur, I replied, the Count of Nidic is afflicted with a complaint strikingly similar to that from which your mother appears to have suffered. If you feel enough confidence in me to communicate to me the facts which you have yourself observed, I will gladly tell you what I know myself for perhaps this exchange of our experiences might supply me with the means to save my patient. Willingly, sir, he replied, and without any further prelude he informed me that the Baroness de Bluderich, a member of one of the noblest families in Saxony, took, every year towards autumn, a journey into Italy, with no attendant besides an old manservant, who possessed her entire confidence, that that man, being at the point of death, had desired a private interview with the son of his old master, and that at that last hour, prompted, no doubt, by the pangs of remorse, he had told the young man that his mother's visit to Italy was only a pretense to enable her to make, you observed, a certain excursion into the Black Forest, the object of which was unknown to himself, but which must have had something fearful in its character, since the baroness returned always in a state of physical prostration, ragged, half-dead, and that weeks of rest alone could restore her after the hideous labors of those few days. This was the purport of the old servant's disclosures to the young baron, who believed that in so doing he was only fulfilling his duty. The son, anxious at any sacrifice to know the truth of this account, had that very year ascertained it first by following his mother to Baden, and then by penetrating on her track into the gorges of the Black Forest. The footsteps which Sebalt had tracked in the woods were his. 
when the baron had thus imparted his knowledge to me i thought i ought not to conceal from him the mysterious influence which the appearance of the old woman in the neighbourhood of the castle exercised over the count nor the other circumstances of this unaccountable series of events we were both amazed at the extraordinary coincidence between the facts narrated the mysterious attraction which these beings unconsciously exercised the one over the other the tragic drama which they performed in union the familiarity which the old woman had shown with the castle and its most secret passages without any previous examination of them the costume which she had discovered in which to carry out this secret act and which could only have been rummaged out of some mysterious retreat revealed to her by the strange instinct of insanity finally we were agreed that there are unknown unfathomed depths in our being and that the mystery of death is not the only secret which god has veiled from our eyes although it may seem to us the most important but the darkness of night was beginning to yield to the pale tints of early dawn a bat was sounding the departure of the hours of darkness with a singular note resembling the gurgling of liquid from a narrow bottleneck a neighing of horses was heard far up the defile then with the first rays of dawn we distinguished a sledge driven by the baron's servant its bottom was littered with straw on this the body was laid i mounted my horse who seemed not sorry to use his limbs again which had been numbed by standing upon ice and snow the whole night through i rode after the sledge to the exit from the defile when after a grave salutation the usual token of courtesy between the nobility and the people they drove off in the direction of hersland and i rode towards the towers of nidic at nine i was in the presence of mademoiselle odile to whom i gave a faithful narrative of all that had taken place then repairing to the count's apartments i found him in a very satisfactory state of improvement he felt very weak as was to be expected after the terrible shocks of such crises as he had gone through but had returned to the full possession of his clear faculties and the fever had left him the evening before there was therefore every prospect of a speedy cure a few days later seeing the old lord in a state of convalescence i expressed a desire to return to fribourg but he entreated me so earnestly to stay altogether at nidic and offered me terms so honourable and advantageous that i felt myself unable to refuse compliance with his wishes i shall long remember the first boar hunt in which i had the honour to join with the count and especially the magnificent return home in a torch-like procession after having sat in the saddle for twelve hours together i had just had supper and was going up into hugh lupus's tower completely knocked up when passing sperver's room whose door was half open shouts and cries of joy reached my ears i stopped when the most jovial spectacle burst upon me around the massive oaken table beamed twenty square rosy faces bright and ruddy with health and fun the hob and knobbing of the glasses gave out an incessant tinkling and clattering there was sitting sperver with his bossy forehead his moustaches bedewed with rhenish wine his eyes sparkling and his grey hair rather disordered at his right was marie lagoutte on his left knapwurst he was raising aloft the ancient silver gilt and chaste goblet dimmed with age and on his manly chest glittered the silver plate of his shoulder belt for according to his custom on a hunting day he was still wearing the uniform of his office the colour of marie lagoutte's cheeks rather redder even than usual told of an evening of jollity and her broad cap frills seemed as if they were wanting to fly all abroad she sat laughing now with one then with another knapwurst squatting in his armchair with his head on a level with sperver's elbow looked like a big pumpkin then came tobias offenlach so red that you would have thought he had bathed his face in the red wine leaning back with his wig upon the chair back and his wooden leg extended under the table farther on loomed the melancholy long face of sebalt who was peeping with a sickly smile into the bottom of his wine-glass 
besides these worthies there were present the waiting people men and women servants comprising all that little community which springs up around the board of the great people of the land and belongs to them as the ivy and the moss and the wild convolvulus belong to the monarch of the forests upon the groaning board lay a vast ham displaying its concentric circles of pink and white then among the gaily patterned plates and dishes came the long-necked bottles containing the produce of the vineyards that border the broad and flowing rhine long german pipes with little silver chains and long shining blades of steel the light of the lamp shed over the whole scene its amber-colored hue and left in the shade the old gray and time-stained walls where hung in ample numbers the brazen convolutions of the hunting horns and bugles what an original picture the vaulted roof was ringing with the joyous shouts of laughter sperver as i have already told was lifting high the full bumper and singing the song of black hatto the burgrave i am king on these mountains of mine while the rosy dew of Affenthal hung trembling from his long moustaches. As soon as he caught sight of me, he stopped, and holding out his hand, Fritz, said he, we only wanted you. It is a long time since I felt so comfortable as I do tonight. You are welcome, old boy. As I gazed upon him with surprise, for since the death of Liberle I had never seen him smile, he added more seriously, We are celebrating the return of Monseigneur to his health, and Knapwurst is telling us stories. All the guests turned my way, and I was saluted with kindly welcomes on all sides. I was dragged in by Sebalt, seated near Marie Lagoutte, and found a large glass of Bohemian wine in my hand before I could quite understand the meaning of it all. The old hall was echoing with merry peals of laughter, and Sperver, throwing his arm around my neck, holding his cup high, and with an attempt at gravity which showed plainly that the wine was up in his head, he shouted, Here is my son, he and I, I and he, until death. Here's the health of Dr. Fritz. Knapwurst, standing as high as he was able upon the seat of his armchair, not unlike a turnip, half divided in two, leaned towards me and held me out his glass. Marie Lagoutte shook out the long streamers of her cap, and Sebalt, upright before his chair, as gaunt and lean as the shade of the wild Jaeger amongst the heather, repeated, Your health, Dr. Fritz, whilst the flakes of silvery foam ran down his cup and floated gently down upon the stone-flagged floor. Then there was a moment's silence every guest drank then with a single clash every glass was set vigorously down upon the table bravo cried sperver then turning to me fritz we have already drunk to the health of the count and of mademoiselle odile you will do the same twice had i to drain the cup before the vigilant eyes of the whole table then i too began to look grave could it have been drunken gravity? A luminous radiance seemed shed on every object. Faces stood out brightly from the darkness and looked more nearly upon me. In truth, there were youthful faces and aged, pretty, and ugly, but all alike beamed upon me kindly and lovingly and tenderly. But it was the youngest, at the other end of the table, whose bright eyes attracted me and we exchanged long and wistful glances full of affection and sympathy sperver kept on humming and laughing suddenly putting his hand upon the dwarf's misshapen back he cried silence here is knapwurst our historian and chronicler he is preparing to speak this hump holds all the history of the house of nidic from the beginning of time the little hunchback not at all indignant at so ambiguous a compliment, directed his benevolent eyes upon the face of the huntsman, and replied, You, Sperver, you are one of the writers whose story I have been telling you. You have the arm and the courage and the whiskers of a writer of old. 
if that window opened wide and a writer was to hold out his hand at the end of his long arm to you what would you say to him i would say you are welcome comrade sit down and drink you will find the wine just as good and the girls just as pretty as they were in the days of old hugh lupus look and he pointed with his glass at the jolly young faces that brightened the farther end of the table certainly the damsels of nidic were lovely some were blushing with pleasure to hear their own praises others half veiled their rosy cheeks with their long drooping eyelashes while one or two seemed rather to prefer to display their sweet blue eyes by raising them to the smoky ceiling i wondered at my own insensibility that i had never before noticed these fair roses blooming in the towers of the ancient manor silence cried sperver for the second time our friend knapwurst is going to tell us again the legend he related to us just now won't you have another instead asked the hunchback no i like this best i know better ones than that knapwurst insisted the huntsman raising his finger impressively i have reasons for wishing to hear the same again and no other cut it shorter if you like there is a great deal in it now fritz listen the dwarf rather under the influence of the sparkling wine he had taken rested his elbows on the table and with his cheeks clutched in his bony fingers and his eyes starting from his head with his concentrated efforts to speak with becoming seriousness he cried as if he were publishing a proclamation bernard herzog relates that the burgrave hugh surnamed lupus or the wolf when he was old used to wear a cowl which was a kind of knitted cap that covered in the crest of the knight's helmet when engaged in fighting when the helmet tired him he would take it off and put on the knitted cowl and its long cape fell around his shoulders up to his eighty-second year hugh still wore his armor though he could hardly breathe in it then he sent for otto of burlock his chaplain his eldest son hugh his second son berthold and his daughter the red-haired bertha wife of a saxon chief named bluderich and said to them your mother the she-wolf has bequeathed you her claws her blood flows mingled with mine in your veins in you the wolf's blood will flow from generation to generation it shall weep and howl among the snows of the black forest some will say hark the wind howls others no it is the owl hooting but not so it is your blood mine and the blood of the she-wolf who drove me to murder hedviga my wife before god and the church she died under my bloody hands cursed be the she-wolf for it is written i will visit the sins of the fathers upon the children the crime of the father shall be visited upon the children until justice shall have been satisfied then old hugh the wolf died from that dreary day the north wind has howled across the wilds and the owl has hooted in the dark and travellers by night know not that it is the blood of the she-wolf weeping for the day of vengeance that will come whose blood will be renewed from generation to generation so says herzog until the day when the first wife of hugh hedviga the fair shall reappear at nidic under the form of an angel to comfort and to forgive then sperver rising from his seat took a lamp and demanded of knapwurst the keys of the library and beckoned to me to follow him we rapidly traversed the long dark gallery then the armory and soon the archive chamber appeared at the end of the great corridor all noises had died away in the distance the place seemed quite deserted once or twice i turned round and could then see with a creeping feeling of dread our two long fantastic shadows in ghostly fashion writhing in strange distortions upon the high tapestry sperver quickly opened the old oak door and with torch uplifted 
his hair all bristling in disorder and excited features, walked in the first. Standing before the portrait of Hedviga, whose likeness to the young countess had struck me at our first visit to the library, he addressed me in these solemn words. Here is she who was to return to comfort and pity me. She has returned. At this moment she is downstairs with the old count. Look well, Fritz. Do you recognize her? Is it not Odile? Then, turning to the picture of Hugh's second wife, there, he said, is Huldina, the she-wolf. For a thousand years she has wept in the deep gorges amongst the pine forests of the Schwarzwald. She was the cause of the death of poor Liverle, but henceforward the lords of Nidic may rest securely, for justice is done, and the good angel of this lordly house has returned. End of chapter 13 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. End of The Man-Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandra Chatrion.